your butterfly. I'm not your picture bright. I am a samurai woman who holds up half the sky. I haven't bowed my head. I haven't bound my feet. I have endured the heat. I'm not afraid to leave. My heart when I took a stride. I am your memory, stories of you and me, moment of breaking free, so you can be. Spirit can't be gauged. I'm living to create. I am. I am. Hey, hey, hey. I am. Ooh, I am. Welcome to the Japanese American National Museum. I'm Anne Burrows, the president and CEO. Um, I hope that when you're next in Little Tokyo, that you'll take a moment to to visit the museum. Or the next time that you're in Los Angeles, that you'll come and visit us. Our doors are open, and we're ready to welcome you. We're ready to welcome you back. I also want to start off by telling you about a new exhibition that's opened at Janum um, called "Life in Pieces: The Diary and Letters of Stanley Hayami," who was a teenager from Alhambra, that along with his family and 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry. Were incarcerated during World War II. He and his family were held at Heart Mountain, and this exhibition tells the extraordinary story of what of of his thinking and his thoughts as he wrote his journal and as he wrote his letters. And they, you know, the regular stories of a young teenager with aspirations and doubts about his future and sort of personal insecurities. And it's also the story of this young man who volunteered. To join the the 442nd and went to fight America's enemies in in Europe, and there he was with extraordinary courage, doing his duty, fighting for freedom and justice, while his own family at home was incarcerated by the same country. It's a moving exhibition, the centerpiece of which is a 360 video VR experience um, that was produced in partnership with um, Noni de la Pena. From Emblematic and Sharon Yamoto, and I'm very pleased to say that that had its world premiere at the Tribeca Film Festival a couple of weeks ago, and it's now showing at Cannes. So it's wonderful to think that Stanley Hayami has taken Janum to Cannes, or Janum has taken Stanley Hayami to Cannes. So our program today is brought to you by Janum's National Center for the Preservation of Democracy, and the center's programs. Examine culture, rights, freedom, and frankly, the enduring fragility of America's democracy. We know that democracy is shaped by people, by experiences, and it's these experiences and conversations that are so important and so relevant. And we know that it's these experiences and conversations that feed into the dialogue and participation. That's essential to transforming attitudes, influencing culture, and promoting an inclusive democracy. So I'm excited about our program today, which celebrates the life and work of one of Japanese America's most beloved artists, activists, and warrior women, Nobuko Miyamoto. She will be joined in conversation and performance by the legendary Chicano musician, activist, and cultural leader Quetzal Flores, who also. Is a long friend of Janum's, and we certainly have a treat in store for you, as they weave their conversation and performance across her new album, 120,000 Stories, and her memoir, Not Your Butterfly: My Love Song of Relocation, Race, Love, and Revolution. So, I'm excited to be able to hand over to Deborah Wong, 
who is going to be leading us in the discussion this afternoon. Deborah is the editor of Not Your Butterfly. She's an ethnomusicologist. I'm sorry, she's an ethnomusicologist and professor at the University of California, Riverside, and she researches Asian American musicians and performers. And her most recent book was Louder and Faster, Pain, Joy, and the Body Politic in, American, in Asian American Taiko. And she's also, of course, a longtime JANA member. So Deborah, over to you. Thank you, Anne. That was a lovely introduction. Um, I am Deborah. I'm Deborah Wong. I should say that there's two audiences at once that we're going to be interacting with today. Um, after a year and a half of remote connection, we're actually in a room today with a small audience, and that audience are friends and family, and it feels good to be in a room together doesn't it? <laughs> There's a different energy in the room, isn't there? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but with that said, there's also, you know, the very much the energy of feeling all of you remotely who are watching at this very moment. Uh, we feel you, too. I mean, you know, if we're going to think in terms of the beloved community, that community is, is you, and, and we feel you as well. Today, we're here to, to celebrate and to recognize and to delve deeply into the, the publication of Nobuko Miyamoto's memoir, which is a long time coming because, in fact, she's had a long and amazing life. And you simply need to read the book because we're only going to give you teasers today, really. You're just going to get the tip of the iceberg today. This, it's a really, it's a wonderful book. It's a beautiful book. And you have, I'm, I'm entirely biased. Of course I am. But it is an extraordinary book, one really worth marking. Um, you are going to hear today Nobuko remote, re reflect on her extraordinary life. Of course, that's going to be part of what we do today. But um, what you're also going to hear today are two dedicated activistas, community-based artists, activists, interacting with one another, two folks who know each other very, very well and have done a lot of work together. So let me bring you a little bit more into Nobuko Miyamoto. And I, I feel foolish doing this because this is a Janum audience, for heaven's sake. Not entirely, but, but many of you, I'm sure, are, are deeply connected to Janum. And if you are of Janum, you know Nobuko Miyamoto. You've seen her appear in, in various events and probably speaking at the annual gala and doing all kinds of great things, right? But so you already know that Nobuko is an amazing community-based artist. She's a third generation. She's Sansei. Uh, she's a singer, she's a songwriter, she's a dancer, a choreographer, um, she does theater, she does, you know, many forms of performance. She's a legendary figure in the Asian American movement, of course. The 1973 album, A Grain of Sand, you know, is, is centrally part of her legacy, but again, only one, one small part of it. She's the founder and director of a local nonprofit organization, Great Leap, which is now over 40 years old, which is saying something for any nonprofit, right, to be around that long and to be flourishing in the ways that it is. Uh, Nobuko is a connector. She is, of course, covered in awards and honors. She's constantly asked to perform and to speak and to appear. You know, but she is, what is she? She's someone who knows how to say no to power. She's someone who knows how to call out injustice. And more than that, she is able to create connections with others and to inspire others to carry the work, you know, to share the work, to think how the work needs to move forward. Nobuko teaches us how to connect respectfully across difference through performance often, but not only. All of this through music, through dance, through performance, through community-based work. Now, if you know anything about Nobuko, you know that she usually has a whole bunch of different projects all going at the same time. But there is no question that 2021 has been a really special year for her. Her double CD album came out from Smithsonian Folkways in January of this year. And it's extraordinary. It's, it's you know, again, it's two CDs. And a lot of music is on those two CDs. One of the albums carries forward some of her older work, uh, some of it never published. The other, CD is, is recent work, very recent work in many cases. Brand new stuff, you know, so you need to listen to the album, which also has um, great liner notes, may I say. Um, 
And then again, her memoir just dropped one month ago in June of 2020. So 2021 is a really good year for Noboko. There is no question. And the thing is, you know, her story just keeps going, right? So, um, so we're going to hear a little bit about that today. She's going to be in conversation with Quetzal Flores, who is an old friend of Noboko's, a collaborator, um, a comrade in arms. Um, how to describe Quetzal. He is, of course, uh, one of the founders of the Grammy Award-winning band uh, Quetzal. He is a program manager for the Alliance for California Traditional Arts. He is deeply embedded in East LA and Boyle Heights. Um, his community-based work um, is far-reaching, deeply based, uh, hugely influential, I should say. Um, his most recent project during our shelter at home year has been to create the Community Power Collective, a brand new East LA based uh, initiative that is going to, I think, really kind of blow the roof off. What it can mean to do community based work is really going to offer models that all of us need. And with that, that, that collective, um, Quetzal is calling himself the cultural power organizer. I love that as a title. Wouldn't we all want that title? I mean, honestly, yeah. So listen, you're going to be hearing two radical thinkers today in conversation, two folks who know themselves, who know each other very well, who um, are friends, who have collaborated in terms of creating the Fandango Ubon project, which I'm sure we're going to hear more about. Uh, Quetzal has served as the co-producer for Nobuko's recent album uh, with Derek Nakamoto. Um, Here's the thing, I don't know what they're going to talk about. And that's pretty great because they are, they are profoundly, uh, uh, well, you never know what they're going to do. You never know where they're going to take us, you know? So that's, that's the cool thing that's going to happen right now. Please use the chat throughout. Please drop in not only questions, when we want questions because there is going to be a QA and a um, section at the end of the event, um, but just drop in your responses, you know? You know, just, you know, Hell yeah, you know, whatever comes to you, drop it into the chat, please, because um, you are part of the community. We want to hear from you. Okay, please, let's bring on Nobuko Miyamoto with Quetzal Flores. So I'd like to start this from, uh, to, by reading a small passage from the book. When I met uh, Quetzal for the, well, not for the first time, but when he invited me to a Fandango class. When I entered the small theater, their class was in process. Quetzal approached and put a, he put in my hands a harana, a small handmade guitar. Play, he commanded. I obeyed. Stepping into the circle of haraneros, gathered around a wooden platform called a tarima. My fingers struggled to recall chords I'd learned on the ukulele, but I felt safe strumming with others. A singer, not Martha the professional, but a community person broke into a verse, her voice becoming more confident as others sang in response. Martha slung her harana behind her and stepped onto the tarima, wearing her black pumps with small straps. She stomped out a simple rhythm, Café con pan, café con pan, and pulled me up for a try. Oh, I get it. We are the drumbeat for the song. In the circle of more than 20, there were no observers. Uh, okay, okay, where am I? Uh, there were no observers. Everyone was participating, learning, playing, and it was fun. I can see how fun fandangos can be addictive, carrying on through a whole night. It hit me that this is sort of like obong. But in that tradition, the, music's, the musicians play on the central platform, the yagura, and people dance around it. As I left the class, I thanked Quetzal, and I threw him an idea. What would happen if we put fandango and Obon together. And he said, yeah. Yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> and that was the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Most definitely the beginning. One of many beginnings. <laughs> yes. And so 
I'm so honored to be here today with you, Nobuko. I love you so much. You're, you've been an inspiration before we even started working together at this capacity. As I mentioned before, I, I used to work at the, uh, what was then called the Japan American Theater as a tech, and you did your Slice of Rice show, and I was blown away, and uh, I was so curious about you and what the hell, who the hell were you? <laughs> and what were you doing, right? <laughs> Where did you come from? And so now, full circle, I, you know, even before I read this book, I had a lot of information. Now I have even more information. So, and with more information come more questions, right? I love the title of your book, Not Your Butterfly. And I love the subtitle, which is My Long Song of Relocation, Race, Love, and Revolution. So I'd like to, to tackle those four themes today and, uh, and really kind of get a snapshot uh, for folks of, of, of why, why these themes, you know, and how do they all interconnect into this wonderful story of your life and uh, by extension, the life of, of multiple communities. And so what I'd like to start with is a quick piece of a song that can lead us into relocation. hundred twenty thousand stories buried in the sand a hundred twenty thousand stories a hundred twenty thousand stories buried in my skin a hundred twenty thousand stories they called it camp but it wasn't summer Wind and sand blew away our lives. I was two years old, a yellow peril, a potential spy. In Santa Anita racetrack, where the rich once watched their horses run. We slept in a horse stall. A soldier watched us with his gun. Sadao wanted to swim, but they said no Japs allowed. He joined the U.S. Army to make his family proud. While he fought in Italy, his family was sent to Manzanar. He never made it back, but he got the Medal of Honor. Whoa, whoa, good old job. Kuroja Stolen lands, stolen lives, stolen dreams, stolen rights. It's an old story. Divide and separate. It's an old story happening today. It's a little slice. <laughs> that you threw at me. <laughs> <laughs> and a painful story it is. Yeah. Um, and not unique to the history of this country. And um, so I'd like to, to ask you to talk about relocation, to talk about that moment you understood what was happening, felt what was happening. Felt more than understood. Mm -hmm. um, and I tried to capture that in the book uh, through the stories that my mother told me and just through the feelings that I had. Um, my first memory was riding on the shoulders of my father on the way to mess hall. And I just saw a lot of heads of people, you know, as we headed towards the mess hall. And it was a dusty, dirty place. And we had to sleep in a horse stall. And the, the next morning, my mother was shocked and alarmed because my whole body was covered with rash. 
and I was allergic to the, to the horse stander. So that was sort of uh, my first memory and through the stories of my mom especially, because my father never talked about the camp. Uh, it was something that he buried and many Japanese buried because it was, it was a moment of shame and, and struggle and uh, many didn't want their children to have to carry that, although we did intergenerationally. We've been carrying it through generations even though it wasn't spoken. And actually speaking of it and telling those stories again through the redress and reparations and through the push of the movement, really, young people in the movement said, we need to tell this story. This story is not only important to us, but it connects us to others who have faced relocation, forced removal in this country. And it gave us a small taste of what that was for them. So I think it's an important moment that we, sh that we, th that we speak about and we reach out to uh, others, even now, children who are separated from their families, uh, who are suffering from the same trauma. You know, now that, that we understand a little bit more about, about health and wellness and, and the impact of let's say, slavery, the impact of genocide of the, of the Native American people, uh, the impact of the uh, incarceration of Japanese Americans, and so on and so forth. Um, storytelling is incredibly important, story sharing. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it provides a pathway for, for healing. Uh, one of multiple pathways that are necessary for healing. And so I wonder if um, this was, this is something that, that you have developed uh, as a, a mechanism for, for healing. And that if, like, what have you seen others do to move towards healing? And I know you mentioned the movement and, and uh, we have somebody here that was a deeply embedded in that, in the, the reparation movement, rejection reparation movement. Um, I, don't, I don't see his camera, but I see him up there. Kathy? <laughs> no, it's, well, Kathy's here too, right? Yes. She is. <laughs> and so, uh, so, yeah, tell me about like, like these, these systems of healing. Because it's not, it's, it is about trauma, but it's also about agency and, and healing and the importance of us having power and, and uh, the ability to move ourselves and collectively our communities into healing? Well, it's interesting that if you talk about healing, my first, as a child, my first moment of healing was actually my father taking me to a concert of music. And here I was in this huge theater on the balcony in Salt, in Salt Lake City looking at a live concert with a hundred players. And after being, really after being re refugees for a couple of years and coming out and he hearing this music as a four-year-old, it took me out of my body. And, I, and it took me beyond myself. So I went home and I, and I played my father's records and I was dancing and I, my mother saw this uh, and she took me to a little dance school in Ogden, Utah. And um, dance, dancing to the music was a place that I felt I belonged somewhere. When you're uplifted, you know, relocated and, and just uprooted from what you think is home, or even at two, you don't know exactly what home is, but you feel safe somewhere. For me, uh, the stage became a place I became safe. In the music was a place that I had a voice. I didn't have a voice before there. I, I didn't have any way of expressing myself. And so this became a way of my healing I me mean, from a very young child, just to have a sense, some place that I could go to that made me feel rooted in my body at first. 
And so I strived to be a dancer um, and wanted to be a ballerina. And um, through this experience, of course, one of my first uh, reality checks was Mr. Loring at the American School of Dance telling me, as he gave me a scholarship, told me, in order to be a dancer, make a living as a dancer, you have to be twice as good as everyone else. So as a 12-year-old hearing that, I mean, I knew that was unjust. Explain that. Why? I knew it was because what I looked like, that I was Japanese-American. It was, you know, we just came out of the war. Uh, there was racism around us and discrimination. And I knew that I was squeezing my way through a very difficult path to, to be a dancer. My mother, though, was incredible. She would show me pictures of the great ballerinas. Oh, here's uh, Sono Osato. She's Japanese and Irish. Here's Alicia Alonso. She's uh, uh, Cuban. You know, she would show me examples of women who were, you know, striving and making it. So that gave me a sense of, oh, it's possible. That, and, and it's a funny thing that dance, especially ballet, was the one place that a woman could be queen. You know, a woman was carried, a woman was, was celebrated. And my mother, who wanted to be an artist, uh, she wanted that for herself. You know, she, did, she was denied that. So she wanted to make sure that I had that space, that opportunity. But in, in show business, you learn very quickly that there are jobs that you just can't get. And Mr. Loring, the director of our school, would send us to auditions, and they would come up to me and say, well, you're very good, but we can't use you. And, and I would, you know, get angry and uh, realize that, of course I knew it was because of what, what I looked like. And then I started getting jobs that I got because of what I looked like. I was working in The King and I with Whiteface, but it's because I can move like an Asian. I could, I, uh, uh, flower drum song, because I, of what I looked like. And at that time, there were very few trained Asian American performers, because their, their families knew it would be hard to make a living. So we've seamlessly moved into the conversation around race. Yes. So you went from, from camp to different parts of the US. You end up in New York as a dancer trying to make a living doing dancing. You end up on Broadway. When did you, when did you realize that, that race was a really, really big thing? You just talked about a couple of moments, but mm -hmm. I think there was probably a moment, a big moment where you were like, <laughs> oh my gosh, like this is like. Yeah, so, so I was standing on the stage of the St. James Theater. <laughs> I'm looking at it. Uh, and I can really remember uh, singing this song, the Rodgers and Hammerstein, not one of his greatest, chop suey, chop suey, and doing something like this, you know. And it was supposed to be a sort of parody and a joke. But I was looking at this audience of blue-haired ladies that came for the matinee. It was a whole audience full of them. And they're just looking up at us, you know. And I, it just hit me. Oh, my God. We're chop suey. We're Chinese food for white people. It hit me really clearly that that's why they were looking at us in that way, a certain way that they looked at us. And I knew that we were put in a certain category. You know, they used our bodies in front of the theater, pictures of us, you know, legs showing, you know, across the street, the world of Susie Wong, you know, very suggestive uh, Asian women, uh, hardly dressed, etc. that we were bait, basically. Uh, so this type of stereotype that, uh, that we represented, we, those are the jobs that we could get. My girlfriend, Reiko Sato, was playing in another show down uh, Broadway called Destry Rides Again, in which she played a prostitute, a Chinese prostitute. So these were the kinds of jobs. And we talked afterwards 
as, as dancers, and we knew that there was racism. We knew that there were limits of what we could do. Um, so we knew in this, in this world of show business, but we were also complicit because we wanted to make it. We wanted to survive and we wanted to make it as performers. So it was this funny uh, relationship that we had. And I, I really wanted to cross the color line. That was my goal. I said, well, maybe I can cross the color line. Maybe I can. So uh, when I went back to LA and I auditioned for uh, West Side Story, uh, luckily, uh, I had worked for Jerome Robbins, uh, and and in this, you know, really the toughest audition I've ever seen, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, and I did get it, uh, and they did a screen test to make sure that I could pass for Puerto Rican, and uh, so this was the kind of uh, Tests that that we as as of course uh, Jose de Vega he was half Filipino he played Chino, and in 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 Latin America there are mixtures of Asians and Latinos, so that's not quite so unusual. But I also knew, at that moment, that what would I follow this with? Here was a musical that I could that I did break the color line, but what? There's so few places that performers can do something like this, Asian Americans or black American and black. So I, at that point, started singing. I started studying singing because I said, well, I could pick whatever songs I want to sing. And I studied with an African American coach, uh, Deanie Clark, who uh, exposed me to other black singers from Lena Horn to Nina Simone to, and I saw that there were women singing powerful songs, Mississippi goddamn, <laughs> this was the 60s. And then I also began to look at the world around me. I began to see that uh, the civil rights movement, and we were living in uh, Los Angeles, and the, and the LA riots happened. So it was getting closer to me, this whole issue of race, and who was I in the middle of this? I wasn't really sure. And it was in um, Seattle. I, I, I got a job singing in a nightclub. Uh, and I was singing, and, I, and, and young people were coming in who were protesting against the war. And they asked me to go to a demonstration. And I felt like, mm, I don't know if I could do that. I just, but I also started feeling like, but what am I doing singing in a nightclub? There's people like me dying out there. What am I doing? My brother could be drafted. What am I doing? So soon after that, I went back to LA and a friend of mine introduced me to this Italian filmmaker, Antonello Branca, who was making a documentaries, but this one was about the Black Panthers. So that was my moment of deeply getting into seeing firsthand what the black movement was about. 1968, the Black Panthers were persecuted, jailed, killed. Um, but I saw them serving breakfast for children. I saw them doing political education classes and reading Chairman Mao, serve the people, you know. I saw them accepting me as a sister. They called me sister, and I, I didn't really understand what that meant, but it felt good. And I felt like they understood about camp. They understood that uh, Japanese Americans had been to camp, and that they, as, uh, as black activists, could end up in those same camps. So that really was the beginning. And then I met, through this making of this film, I met uh, Yuri Kochiyama in New York. And she asked me if I knew any Asian activists in New York. And I had never, you know, conceived of Asian Americans being activists like the black. And she says, come to this meeting of Asian Americans for actions. And my brother and I 
went to this meeting, and at this meeting, not only were there young people who were activists, but their elders, some of them family members, so mothers and sons and fathers and, 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 and daughters, at the same meeting of Asian Americans for Action. And I went, oh my God, what is this? You know, I couldn't imagine my mom and dad going to a meeting like that and talking about supporting the Panthers or talking about ending the war. So that was really the beginning. Uh, and also, I just dropped everything. I dropped my personal ambitions. I just dropped everything and picked up the leaflets just like everybody else. So you stopped doing Broadway? Oh yeah, I was Completely. out of Broadway 10 years. I was, I was just, I was searching for something and I didn't know what it was. But that's what I found. And so, in finding this, movement, um, you found other Asian American people that were doing this yes. that, and that were passionate about it, besides Yuri, of course. <laughs> uh, and, and you found a way to get involved that was, that was very tangible. Well, you know, at first, uh, we were just organizing demonstrations against the Vietnam War. We went to Washington. We, we, we had a huge contingent of Asian Americans coming from all over the country. It was the first time I felt, oh my gosh, we're a movement. It, it was powerful to be there. And then you, uh, uh, Warren Furitani came to New York and uh, asked us, at Asian Americans for Action to come to Chicago for a meeting of the JACL, the Japanese American Citizens League, to, because they were bringing people from the West Coast to make them take a stand against the Vietnam War. So we went. And so this, the, the immediate urgency was around the Vietnam War. Yes. However, <laughs> You know, as as we heard from from your story about relocation and, and from the things we know about the the history of this country, there was also this this need to be responsive to imperialism, to white supremacy, to capitalism, and and patriarchy. And so, what were the conversations like in those spaces? What what were you know what was what was the the like the sort of large goal or action that was being planned or, or, or thought about? Let me take you back to Chicago, because okay. that's going to plant the, the seed or the stake that we put in the ground. <clears throat> After we met with our brothers and sisters from the West Coast, we, the next day, we went to the Black Panther office, and they had just lost Fred Hampton, and there they were, carrying on in spite of that. Young people, young black uh, activists, and they accepted us as brothers and sisters. We, we were walking home and we happened to bump into a, a demonstration of Native Americans and they had a big teepee in front of Wrigley's Field. And they were fighting for decent housing for urban Indians. But when they saw us, they sort of dropped their leaflets and they brought us into their circle and sat us down and they did ceremony with us. They must have thought, because we were Asians, they look, we look like their cousins, you know? And they just brought us into this circle and they did ceremony and they told us the story there would be 5,000 years of evil followed by 5,000 years of good. And that change would come when warriors, all the colors of the rainbow, would come together. So we were in this moment where we suddenly saw it. We were with Native Americans, we were with black people. We were walking back to, the, to this church where we were sleeping on the floor, and, we, and some Germans were throwing cans at us, a German neighborhood, 
you know, calling us Japs and chinks. And, and we realized, OK, <laughs> we were experiencing something very deep. And we, but we, our armor had become this idea of warriors of the rainbow. That we were not just Asian Americans in the movement, that we were Asian Americans who were part of a greater movement of people of color who were standing up to imperialism, to, to colonialism, um, do things like slavery and relocation in America. And they were fighting in their own different ways in their own communities. At the same time, a young girl was murdered, one of our people in, in Chicago. Uh, somebody came and slit her throat in the, her hotel room. And it was, this was Chicago. And it was like they were trying to make us fear. They were threatening us. They, we were, here we were with black people. Here we were with Native Americans. And they killed this young sister. And we realized, just like Freda Hampton had been sacrificed, that we also had a sacrificial lamb. And that sort of deepened our commitment that, of what we had to do. That we were part of something more bigger than ourselves. And that night, Chris brought out his guitar. And he just started strumming and, you know, I didn't know he sang and I didn't know he played. And, I just started following along with him, and we spontaneously made a song. The next day, we sang that song in front of this convention of the Japanese American Citizens League and our young activists. And everybody felt at that moment we had never had our own song. And this was a moment that we just had an opportunity to deliver it. So it wasn't the first song that we wrote, but this song. We are the children of the migrant worker. We are the offspring of the concentration camp. Sons and daughters of the railroad builder who leave their stamp on America. We are the children of the Chinese waiter, born and raised in the laundry rooms. We are the offspring of the Japanese gardener who leave their stamp. On America Sing a song for ourselves What have we got to lose? We've got to sing a song for ourselves We've got the right to choose We've got the right to choose. We are the cousins of the freedom fighter, brothers and sisters all around the world. We are a part of the third world people who will leave our stamp on America. Who will leave our stamp on America? Yes, we leave our stamp on America. America. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about love for a little bit. <laughs> I mean, okay. really at the heart of, of all this, yes. you know, is love. And love happens in different ways, you know, romantic love, love for a child, 
you know, love for community, et cetera, et cetera. This is a very complex and, and varied uh, experience. And so talk to me a little bit about, about the birth of your child and, and that discovery of love, that new discovery of love as you're, you're in the movement and, and you become a parent for the first time. This is, this is big. So I was afraid at first. Um, I was pregnant and I came back to Los Angeles to be part of the Japanese American community to serve. And I was going to have a black child. So I was, I didn't know what to do. And the place I landed was at Senshin Buddhist Temple. <laughs> and I talked to Reverend Moss about it. And Moss, who I really didn't know that well at that moment, and he said, well, what do you feel? And I said, I just, I just feel I have to do this. And he said, don't go against your feelings. They'll talk about you at first, <laughs> but then you'll be just like everybody else. <laughs> so that really gave me the courage, you know, to, to go against my family's feelings. Maybe the community? I didn't know. And it turned out it was the best thing, decision I ever made in my life. Uh, his father w was killed uh, 10 weeks after he was born. So uh, he was an uh, activist in New York City uh, with Malcolm X. He was. So he, he uh, was taken from us, and I knew that, oh, I had to make up for this loss. I knew that black women had lost their husbands and their lovers and their children, and I only had one child to take care of, and I could do it. I could do it not because of me necessarily, but because I had a community around me. <clears throat> uh, and the Asian American movement really closed in. So I'll, I'll pick up a little bit. So you didn't just land in the Japanese American community. Thanks to redlining and racist policies like that, there were places in L.A. where Japanese people and black people lived together. We, yes, we always did. So <laughs> you kind of lucked out <laughs> raising True a black that. child True that. in a Japanese community that yes. was also a black community. Yes. And um, so being uh, near the Jefferson, Crenshaw, you know, uh, Lamert Park uh, community, uh, and Senshin was only a, a stone's throw from that. So I sort of raised Kamau between these two worlds. Uh, we were at, the, at, the, at Senshin where I was teaching dance and doing creative work. And he was sleeping on the floor <laughs> and crawling on the floor eventually and, and, and sleeping through taiko drumming, etc. And then uh, I lived in a neighborhood. Uh, and one of my neighborhoods was uh, uh, two of my neighborhood friends were uh, Dale and Alonzo Davis, and they ran the Brockman Gallery in Lamert Park. And I could see that my son was drawing all the time, and he was always, you know, so I just said, oh, he needs to be exposed to art. And I saw, so I, you know, we became part of that community, uh, and I, you know, created songs and dances with the children who were mixed just like 
Gamal was. And it was a place that we could feel like we were, that we weren't so different, you know. It was a community that embraced us and protected us. And um, the black men in those, that community knew how to put their arms around black boys. And they knew how to help raise them. And also my brother and the Asian American movement, they were great. You know, I lived in a collective house, so there were about seven of us. Uh, my brother and I lived upstairs, and there were about four or five guys living in the house downstairs. So we cooked together. They bought me a washing machine so I could wash diapers. And uh, we put our money together, and uh, we could live on seven, we could eat on seven dollars a week. And I only had to cook once a week, you know, so it just went around like that. And that was a great way to actually to live uh, and to, uh, and I had the support of, of all these people around me. I have a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we, we got to, we got to, I have to move this okay. because of time. Okay. So, <laughs> Revolution. Okay. I was watching uh, Summer of Soul the other day, and I was completely moved, like most people who watched it mm -hmm. were. Um, and there was one moment where Nina Simone, not unlike Nina Simone, <laughs> gets in front of the audience and is asking questions, asking very important questions. And one of those questions was, are you prepared to kill? And if you don't know what black people have gone through, if you don't know what Native American people have gone through, if you don't know what Mexican people and Japanese American people and Chinese people in this country have gone through, what Muslims have gone through in this country, you won't understand that statement. Yes, well, in a a film, actually, with a conversation between Yuri Kojiyama and um, Angela Davis. Angela spoke about living, I think it was in Alabama, she grew up, and she said everybody in the black community, every house had to have a gun because they had to protect themselves. Black people were being assaulted in the South, I mean, my mother-in-law, Mamie Kirkland, uh, her father had to, and his friend had to leave overnight because they were going to be lynched. This was common. Her father talked about seeing bodies hanging from trees in, in the area that they lived in when they walked through the, through the, the woods. So black people have been, and, and why did the Black Panthers start? They were, they were, it was self-defense. They were trying to defend the community from police brutality. So this has gone from slavery times to the present, the assault on black men. And of course, last year, we saw it right before our eyes. So it's not some people, for some people that was news, but for a lot of people, that was normal. They knew that happened that happened to friends, that happened to family. Actually, that happened to the uncle of the young girl who, who did the camera. That happened to him just, I don't know, was it last week or something? Yeah. So how do we protect ourselves, you know? And, and at that time in the movement in the 70s, there was talk about armed struggle because it, people had to dis, to protect themselves. How are we going to uh, defend our communities? And so, it, of course, this happened in a moment in time. And but revolution is not only about picking up a gun. It was it was it was really about serving the community, about making our communities resilient and and self sufficient. It was about serving children uh, food in the morning so they would go to school. And, and could think and function. Uh, it was about, you know, housing. It was about jobs. Uh, these were the simple things which we still 
you know, we just driving down here, we saw people living in in tents and and tent cities and and wooden, you know, rooms that they built next to the freeway. We're still struggling for these things. It shouldn't be this way in America or anywhere. What would be your ideal situation for human beings <laughs> and the planet <laughs> uh, if you, you could dream up uh, a world for us? Oh, a small question you're asking me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a simple if question. I ruled the world. It's a simple question. <laughs> what would it be like? Well, you know, we have a... Uh, I, I was lucky because when I came to L.A., I landed in Senshin Buddhist Temple, and I landed in a community that had traditions, that had ways of gathering that had ways of cooking, that had ways of not wasting food. Uh, they had ways of, you know, we had ways of living that were much more simple than today. Um, we survived in camp because people took the seeds into camp with them. And they could grow the food that they wanted to grow because it would, there was, the U.S. government was not going to provide it for them. So we, ha we are resourceful. Um, and we have traditions that, that have taught us this. Not all of it is good, of course. There are bad things in some of our traditions, but we could pick the good things in our traditions that, that have strengthened us and that have taught us good ways to live. And so I see us going back to some of those traditions, to, to learning from them. I mean, I think that was the impulse in the black movement during the, the 60s and 70s when, when Nina Simone got up there in, in her African garb and, and was claiming who she was uh, uh, in so many ways. So, claim, and I mean, even being here at Janum, you know, this is claiming who we are. This is part of our story. And, and claiming our story, even the hard parts of our story, is really important. These are the things that teaches us who we are, how strong we are, what we survived, what we understand about not only our community, but about other communities. Uh, so embracing those things that are even tough that's happened to us is really important, I think. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book, because I want my grandchildren to know uh, the long story not just, you know, what's happening, what they get on their phone right now. More recently, we've been doing a project together, Fandango Bon. Yes. And it's about to be the ninth year. We skipped a year, right? But no, eighth year. This is the eighth year. This would be the eighth year. Okay. So what is, what is the power of Fandango Bon? What is the potential power of Fandango Bon? I don't think we've even, we, we, we've begun to, to scratch the surface of it. There's many different levels of coming into the circle, which is sort of an ancient way that people gathered. But the circle is uh, just like this hall right here is, is, in a, is in a part of a circle. A circle makes you feel included. This is a big word right now, inclusion. <laughs> and um, to be in a circle means that you can see everybody. Everybody is equal. To be in a circle, especially the way we do it, is that we can listen to each other's stories and traditions and share those traditions uh, without a filter. We don't have a television screen. We're right there in person. But not only that, we participate in our, with our bodies, with our rhythms, with our songs. And there's something, and I, it goes back to, to being a dancer, I think, and knowing that the physical body, you know, we have, we have memory in ourselves, you know. Everything, we are affected by things deeply 
through our bodies and to encompass somebody else's way of moving even is learning their language. To sing with them is learning their language. To dance to their stomp, doing cafe compas is learning a language. So we have the, the opportunity in this country, being as diverse as we are, of learning many languages and learning not to fear those languages that we could pick, you know, the good things each of us can, what are the things that are strong about it? What are the things we can learn from it um, that makes us stronger, that makes us more open, that makes us, because sometimes one culture won't, won't express everything we want in our souls, you know. And maybe that's why Japanese people love jazz, because that speaks to something that they want to express or feel. Um, so there's, there's this crossover. Why do I love salsa, you know? <laughs> why do I, the, the drum, the African drum, the, all, these different rhythms are mixed in with it. So I'm feeling all of these things on a visceral level, not just a, okay, we're winding into the ending of our conversation here. <laughs> are, you, are you sure you're not Chicano? <laughs> you, just, you just described our reality. Uh, wait, did, did we get a chance to see? We didn't get a chance to see. Do we have a moment to see uh, cycles of change? We do? Well, so this was the first project we did together, actually. And I just want to show even two minutes of it because they're, uh, of the wonderful way that we got introduced to each other. Uh, when I walked out of the, uh, 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 the concert that you did at, uh, at Pasadena City College and I was working on, a, on an environmental video about bicycling and I was, got stuck and I said, maybe I should call them up and see if they could help. And boom, we got together and, and we made this our first collaboration, which is really a jump. You don't know what it's going to be, but here's the first leap of faith that we took together. That was a great catch because I think it's really important for the audience to see Nobuko and Quetzal and Marta and Sandino all together performing. Uh, so much has, has come from these collaborations between all of you. Um, I'm thrilled to say that there's uh, some comments and questions in the chat. Okay, I'm going to bring them on. Let's see. Um, Shirley Omori says, powerful advice from Reverend Moss. So <laughs> moving. Strong support. Love. So that's a nice one, huh? Um, we have a question from Emily Anderson. She asks this, Nobuko, you've experienced so much so far. 
But one thing I've always admired about you is how much you are here in the present and have hope. How do you feel about where we are as a society now? How do we hold on to hope for restoration and reconciliation when we seem so divided? Well, there's nothing that spurs hope more than participating to change, to be a changer. Uh, that gives you energy, it gives you vision, it gives you motivation, right? Um, even if you see small changes, um, you have hope. You see it when you see younger people standing up and having voice that gives you hope. Um, so they're, they're Yes, we live in a very complicated, difficult time, but we've come, we've come a ways and we have a lot of people that are maybe invisible in a lot of communities that perhaps people don't know about what they're doing, but there is a lot of stuff going on underneath the surface of what we see on television or whatever. There is a lot of things going on in communities that give me hope. Yes. Oh, gosh, Nobuko, your middle name is Hope. You really teach a kind of compassionate connection over and over again that I, I have learned much from. Um, audience, we really do invite your questions and your responses. Um, you know, we're, 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 our eyes are on the chat waiting for you to ask something, but um, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to ask a question. And I wonder if the two of you could talk a little bit about what you've learned about revolution and liberation from one another. I feel like I've seen that happen, but I'd love to hear. I've never actually asked you about it. Yeah, what have you learned from each other about revolution? <laughs> no, you know, actually, uh, I feel like uh, the work that, I, I, that we began uh, with Martha and uh, Quetzal, really, that gave me hope. Uh, it, it opened up a whole other door. Uh, and also because they're both very theoretical, it's like, oh, now I know what I'm doing. Oh, now I know why I'm doing it. <laughs> because they're very clear and intentional about what uh, the music is doing, how it's working. They're, and so it's, I've been really learning a lot through these years and uh, through the sort of discipline and rigor that you guys uh, have in the work that you do uh, and understanding of how social change, not only here, uh, but all the places that you've traveled, especially in Mexico, to see things in practice that maybe we don't see here. Quetzal, what have you learned from, from the well, I mean. I have the benefit of having somebody who's, who's lived an entire lifetime of, of movement experiences and, and who um, has a lot of, of uh, foresight in terms of, you know, potentially what, what we want to do and, and the intended impact being connected to you know, what we're actually doing versus just kind of running around and, and trying stuff and you know we do that too but that's part of it right but um and then the meeting and and building a relationship with Nobuko was really a, a very deep affirmation of of my own existence and my ideas that you know I, I didn't necessarily feel comfortable sharing with other people because because they're crazy right or they seem crazy um, I mean to me they're normal but they seem crazy and so Finding someone as crazy as I was and who was willing to, like, you know, just say yes to things because it sounded good, uh, you know, that it was really, it's been really life affirming. And because of that, we've been able to build really powerful things that, that uh, whether or not we're involved will continue on. Yes. There, there's, you know, ideas jump. Ideas, if they, if something clicks, you know it, it, you know, and you can't really always, we didn't know when we wrote Bambutsu what, that, that a festival was going to result from it. 
but we knew the process of it was guiding us. And that again was Reverend Moss who, who sat us down before we wrote the song and said it shouldn't be a fusion. It should be a conversation, which meant we needed to stay true to our own voices and cultures, but then talk to each other. And, that's, and that process of holding that and, and allowing us to do that uh, created, and how did that song just boom, you know, really exploded out and to be something that we, we, we couldn't have imagined of when we first started. You know, bringing communities together. Uh, you know, uh, you know, having it spread. You know, so that you know, people doing it in Obon, doing it in the street in uh, in uh, on First Street. And just ye a day before yesterday, I had lunch with Reverend Moss, and he says, "I still want to see uh, us dancing across the First Street Bridge." <laughs> so you know, we've been talking about this, but uh, so these are you know, crazy ideas. It is crazy in, in some ways, you know. Uh, artists do crazy things, but there's a, there's a, there's a reason behind our craziness. Uh, yeah, there's a reason behind it. <laughs> Most of the time. <laughs> Can I ask a quick follow-up on that? Because I, I, I love everything you just said. Um, I wonder if you could say a little bit about, both of you, by the way, um, about trust. Um, how to build trust. Obviously, trust isn't just out there and in some abstract way. One has to build it. How did you build trust between the two of you? you know, and, and was the writing of, of Bambutsu, uh, was that part of the trust building exercise? Can you really take us into how you wrote that song together? That would be, I think, my question. I, I started you know, I listen. If I, there's a lot of songs that wouldn't have happened without Reverend Moss. Right. He gave us a title, Bambutsu no Tsunagari, 10,000 Things All Connected. I, right away, I thought, La Bamba. <laughs> I was thinking La Bamba when he said, and I was like, oh, La Bamba, Bambutsu. But, because uh, I was looking to see some kind of connection. And then, and then I wrote a verse in the circle we danced, no beginning, no, be no ending in the circle. We dance. I am you. You are the other me, which is a now what uh, phrase. And the, and then then I gave it to him. Then you just did something. Yeah, I, I, I certainly did something. <laughs> you did. You know, I have a great memory, but that I don't remember. I don't remember like the, the actual process. I remember being in in our apartment upstairs in Pasadena and. Having Danny there and yeah. you and Nancy. No, but even before that, we, yeah. we had musicians in the room. Yeah, yeah. It, it was a writing session and, and, you know, just kind of going with it. And, yeah, there was the conversation. And just so, so folks have context, La Bamba is part of the Fandango tradition that, that, that I'm a part of. And it's a very important piece. Uh, and it's a very important piece in terms of Chicano history and Chicano rock music. Because Richie Valens recorded that in a rock and roll style, which is rooted in black black expression in the 50s at a time where Mexicans were being attacked continuously uh, and not unlike today and uh, he had he had already hit the hit with Donna and he decided to, re to record La Bamba he could have done anything he wanted to do and he decided to record La Bamba and so it was a very radical and revolutionary act in, in this time uh, and so La Bamba has a bunch of different connecting points. And so, you know, connecting Bambutsu to La Bamba, if you listen to the rhythm of, of Bambutsu, it, it, it has a Bamba-esque sort of rhythm. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff that goes into the, the process of writing a song, a lot of conversation, a lot of, of, you know, drawing from, like Reverend Moss asked us to do, drawing from those traditional uh, bases, drawing from the, the, the memory of root, uh, and then being able to, to articulate it in a way that makes sense for all of us. Yeah, we had the shamisen, you know, had a certain, uh, a very traditional Japanese, you know, uh, phrase. phrase. And uh, that was sort of like the undergird and the taiko. And then when you put the, uh, the, you put the harana in there and just doubled it up and lifted it up, <laughs> it lifted up and 
but um, I remember we were in the circle, I think it was in 2018, that uh, we were doing this piece. I don't, was it La Bamba you were doing? And Tia, Tia Nieves, there was somebody that sang that was not part of our group. She was an elder and she sat down. She was sitting and she sang, and it was La Bamba, she was singing. And I went like, who is that? I didn't recognize it, but it was somebody that was singing. It just touched me. What? It was Tia Licha. <sighs> yeah. And that's how they do. They tell their stories. Um, and she had, her husband had been sick. They had been stuck in this country. Uh, they couldn't get back home. But you could feel something in her voice, and everybody sort of, you know, I felt like the energy of the, the circle just gathering around her as she, as she was doing this. And it was, so we talk about healing. I feel like being in that circle is a healing moment. Uh, Sumak also said that coming off uh, in 2018, she said, I needed this. She's always been there. And, and she, you know, the thing is, there is something healing about dancing together and making that music together in the circle that you can't really describe. And you can't describe when we're, when we're doing uh, the hadra and to slowly turning and feeling like the, the roof was lifted, that we were all lifting off the yeah. ground together. Uh, there's something about the physical activity of moving together that you also feel in Obon when you when you're doing when you enter the space, it is ceremony that we're doing. So it's not just you know that I you know there is it's a it's a form of ceremony that we are doing. Uh, it's a ritual that we are doing, and um, it's a spiritual act. Ophelia Sparsa calls it arriving. Arriving. So this is how we learn from each other. <laughs> This is how exactly. we learn. Exactly. Arriving. I felt like you were going, I felt like you were thinking something about trust, Quetzal. <laughs> Do you want to share that? Well, I mean, Nobuko, she said it, yeah, you know, and okay. it's, it's experience by experience. Every time mm -hmm. we, we engage with one another, you, you, you arrive you know how to arrive, and that knowing how to arrive informs the relationship, right? And you understand that everybody has specific needs, uh, and that you can't treat everyone the same way. And so, when you're when you're building a relationship, you just you have to pay attention and listen. And then, you know, and I know sometimes you think I'm not listening <laughs> when you're telling me to do stuff. No, you tell me to do stuff. <laughs> But I'm listening. Oh, I'm listening. No, but the other thing about trust is taking a risk. You never know what's going to happen, really. I didn't know it was going to work, really. You take a risk. We all have to take a risk. That's part of being an artist also, is you learn how to take a risk. Can I leap from here to there? I don't know. I have to take, I have to try at least, right? You have to take a risk. And so the same thing of leaving our communities or or in crossing into other communities, at first it feels a little uncomfortable, but you take the risk of being uncomfortable. And then finding out it wasn't so crazy, it wasn't so difficult. What was I afraid of, you know? Yeah, I ate shit and it wasn't that bad. <laughs> you know, I'll try it again. Maybe I'll make it next time. No, but I love what Reverend Ma says about dancing in Obon. You can either be... Oh, uh, you, uh, you, you can either be a fool watching or a fool dancing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, so might as well dance. Yeah, take the risk. Yeah, take a risk. Take a risk. That's an ego thing, too, you know, in, in the, from the Buddhist point of view, is that we want to look good. We want to be, have a good appearance, you know. 
but oh, most of the things that happen that have happened by accident in a way you stumble into things and then you say oh my god that was really great you know that was a great experience so oh gosh you too <laughs> i have learned so much by by watching them work together watching them enjoy one another you know and learning how to arrive learning how to listen is so much part of their their method their praxis you know their way of living really um we're towards wrapping up now, and I should say thank you, thank you, thank you to Jana for, for putting this together today. We're so grateful. Thank you to all of you in the live audience and the remote audience for being with us today. Um, you know, just, just um, being together in these ways is so important over and over again, especially during this summer where we're all missing Obon and Bonondori very much. Um, thank you especially to Anne Burroughs and to Joy Yamaguchi for making all of this happen in the room. And I should say that I've loved watching Nobuko um, write and rewrite her book. I've loved sitting beside her and, and learning about her through her book and just directly from her. And I think you need to hear the final passage from her book. It's pretty extraordinary. And it's also really for all of you. So let's hear her read that. In an age in which most of us spend too much time observing the world through our rectangular devices, to step into the circle of Fandango Bon is a potent communal act. In this circle, we reclaim our power, our creativity. We make music with our own hands, our own voices. We circle the earth with our feet and remember we belong to it. In this circle, everyone is equal. Everyone is seen. Everyone has a place. In this circle, there are no borders, no us, no them. There is plenty of room for more circles. In this circle, we weave our many roots, knowing our diversity is our strength. In this circle, we are enacting the world we want to live in. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joy Amaguchi. I'm the public programs coordinator here. And so on behalf of Janum, um, I want to thank Professor Deborah Wong. I want to thank Quetzal Flores and, of course, Nobuko Miyamoto. Can everyone at home and also here in the audience please join me in a wonderful round of applause for both of them? Um, there's nothing like being back in a room together with some of you, and we look forward to welcoming more of you in the room soon again. And to our galleries, like Anne mentioned at the beginning of the program, we hope to come see you here at the museum, here in our new exhibitions. And of course, please purchase the book, get the CD. Um, all the copies at Janum are signed, and our members do get a discount in the store, so you can find that all on our website. Um, and we really hope that you enjoy the book and that you laugh and cry with all of us again like we did today so thank you so much everyone again and we're going to close out with another video but thank you so much to everyone who is here and thank you thank you Nobuko and Quetzal and um, we're going to take it away with this video thank you everyone welcome everybody my name is Nobuko Miyamoto and we're going to learn today a dance called Bambutsu no Tsunagari which means 10,000 things all connected now Fandango comes from Veracruz, Mexico, and Obon, of course, is from the Japanese tradition, which we dance in a circle to remember our ancestors. I'm going to teach you the simple dance, only four steps, very easy, okay? So this is the fun part. You are going to put yourself before your camera, and you're going to shoot yourself doing the uh, dance. Circle, dance. One other. For this, you plan, you lose. For this, you plan, you lose. Don't plan, just dance. Practice for.
together.